all the organizers for, for the opportunity to talk here. I also want to thank you everybody who is joining us. Uh, uh, this is, uh, and then I apologize for every, I'm going to say a lot of wild lies, little lies. And then I apologize for those in advance. And, and, and anyway, so what I'm going to talk about is the modular space of cubic surfaces. And this is a work with Matker and watch you. I was a postdoc there. And then uh, we look at Shocker. He is an uh, KTH. And has the announcement, no, I'm right now on Riverside here in California. So let's just start with this. So we want to compactify this modular space. And I want to start with one perspective, the so-called minimal model perspective. So what do we do in that case? So I, I feel like I have to write this figure, but in the minimal model perspective, what we have is a, a smooth cubic surface. And then it's a classical fact that that cubic surface has 27 lines on it. And these lines don't have a moduli, they don't move. So why do we care about this? Because together with the surface and the 27 lines, we can add them all together and make a divisor. And that divisor has a particular property. And it's first that uh, if you add it to a canonical, it's going to be ample. And second is that for a generic cubic surface, I mean, the surface will be smooth, but also the lines meet uh, transversally. So it's a very nice divisor, exactly in the way that we um, that I am showing you right here. Let me double check that you can see. So this is kind of the typical example. And then, so what I'm interested to think about is the moduli of these pairs, the cubic surface and the 27 lines. What do I want to consider that? That will be apparent in a second, but for now I want to say that if the surface is smooth and the lines intersect transversally, then your, your modular space is a four dimensional open variety. And, and there is the question, the fundamental question here is how can we compactify this modular space? That's kind of what I want to tell you. What will MMP tell you to, how will it tell you to do that? Well, the story here is that this is a story of a lot of people, contribution of a lot of people, but I want to highlight two of them, Colin Shepard Baron and Alex Seff, that develop a theory that allow you to compactify this modular space. And that compactification is sometimes called KSBA, which is the put that we put here. So in this uh, modular space, we are going to compactify, of course, we will have a, a loss of parameterizing our smooth pairs, but we also have to allow the generation. And this is kind of a key idea in moduli spaces is that if you want to compactify this space, you have to add objects who have some kind of singularities. So in this particular uh, perspective, we will keep the fact that it's ample, but we will add, allow singularities that are called semi low canonical And we roughly add well behave from the perspective of MMP. And uh, I promise you that will be much more specific in a little bit. So we have these semi low canonical singularities and the machinery, this machinery that Alexei Kolarchep and Baron, Kovacs, a lot of people uh, develop. Uh, what it will give you at the end, Vivek, is that uh, you have a moduli stack, moduli functor, and you have a coarse moduli space. It is four dimensional. And a priori, this course moduli space is a projective scheme. So whenever you have this kind of setting, there is two questions that I care about or that I personally want to answer. And is first, what is the geometry of the course moduli space? You have a scheme, what kind of a scheme is it? And the second question is, what are the pairs parameterized by the moduli functor? And by this, I mean that you have a loss I parameterizing the a smooth cubic surfaces with the 27 lines, but you are adding new objects to compactify. And I would like to know what are those objects? What are the surfaces that you have? Well, and it turns out a lot of people uh, care about this question and then, and this answer. So in particular, 
hack and kill and develop um, use this theory, this theory from KSDA to describe the uh, compact modular space that we'll call this one and which is associated to our pairs. So the following is a theorem from Hack and Kill from 2007. And then I must say that um, I will give you a second to read it. And I must say that um, they proved this for um, their PESO surfaces. It's a little it's more general than I, will, I just wrote here. So the first thing is that in general, it can be a projective scheme, but this case is a, a smooth projective variety. Which is it is um, it is remarkable because uh, modular space of pairs who are smooth projective varieties are very rare, and particular dimension larger than one. I think that this is the only example that I know, for example, larger than one. This hold for other del pesos. Like again, their work is more general, but for cubic surfaces we have this smooth projective variety. Now it's a smooth. Now you wonder about the boundary. What are the what is the structure of this law side that you are adding at infinity? And the answer is, uh, is a union of a smooth divisor with normal crossing. So the compactification in some sense is as nice as you want it to be. And because this is a smooth variety and, and you have this uh, a smooth divisor, you can, comp you can ask about um, the low canonical model of this, of this compactification. And it happens to be a smooth variety constructed in 1980, I should say, not 82, but 80 by uh, Naruki. So um, now we have, um, and then so after the answer all these questions and much more, there is a question that Hack and Kill kind of points out. And is, so you have this compactification, which is your modular space. And if you think about it like just a variety and you think you, you have your low canonical model, you wonder, is this Naruki variety a modular space itself? Because a priori is not. And, and, by an, uh, and you would like to know uh, uh, this answer. And this Naruki variety has been around like again, 20 years already. So uh, I would like to know if it has a meaning in the context of modular spaces. So, and there is a second question that I also would like very much to, to kind of understand better. And is, um, what are the generations parameterized by this conjectural modular space, right? Because if you see, I mean, and this is something I really think about it, like limits. I mean, I remember in calculus, they give you they give you a series and you have to decide if it converges or no, but you never know what it converges. And then somehow in here is like, okay, I know that this has a compact, if it has, it has a limit because it's a compact space, you have a family of cubic surfaces that they generate, but I would like to know what is the surface that you find uh, when, when you go to this, to this boundary. So that's kind of the two questions that lead the, uh, our work for a while. And then- um, yeah, can I ask a question? Yes. Can I yes. ask a question or the first question? Is there any good reason for n bar to expect it would be a good modular space? Yes, uh, so it is kind of a philosophy somehow called the hack and kill program. And is that um, the expect, uh, it is an expectation that it happened in MG bar. It's, it's a whole industry in MG bar, and it's a very interesting that to interpret the, you have a modular space, and you take a bar rational model, you get another modular space. So it is it's something that uh, I, don't is, is, I don't know if it's expected, but it's something that is looked after. Uh, but a priori, just a projective variety. So you don't know if it's functor associated to it. So a priori, no, but it's expected. That's what we like to see, kind of the pretty answer that we want to find. So uh, so to put this in context, let me just tell you what is this uh, Naruki space. Uh, that's kind of 1980. So when you look at, the, at this Naruki paper from 1982, what you will find is that uh, first you have, um, just a second. Ooh. 
no that much. Apologize, yes. So first they work with mark cubic surfaces. So a marking of a cubic surfaces is that you label the lines basically. That's how you want, you want to understand. I mean, most of you know that cubic surface can be built from a P2 by blowing at six points. So we'll, you have label six of these lines, uh, then, then you have a marking of it. The important part that I want to, I want to say about that is this is finite data. You still have, your modular space is still four dimensional. And in Naruki, they don't uh, give a modular interpretation to their space. However, they have an open. And in that open, they have, it's four dimensional, so you need four parameters. And with those four parameters, they, they have this sentence that I just include here. And they mention, oh, well, you know, we actually have cubic surfaces associated to this, uh, mm to these uh, parameters and it was built by Kelly. And they write the questions. And if you see, I kind of, I kind of move it and then it kind of went off. So let me see if I can fix it. But I want you to notice that this is, if you change this, the value of these parameters, then you can find different cubic surfaces. And that's the, and, that, and, and it's kind of remarkable because this is, uh, and you obtain all the smooth cubic surfaces this way. That's the work. That's what they, what they find. So, so when we saw this family back like months ago, we saw the family, we we're like, okay, we don't have a modular space of, of, of surfaces, but what about the lines? What's happening with the lines? Do we have families of the lines of them? Because remember this, this smart cubic surfaces, they contain 27 lines. So the question is, where are the lines going? <laughs> Basically, where do the lines go? So for doing that, we actually went to um, the um, Kelly paper from 19, 1869. And then you, if you go to their paper and there is a lot of work of that time that you find the coordinates of the 27 lines I don't, I'm not asking you to make sense of that right now. It is 100 years of notation, but you have the 27 lines, the coordinates in terms of these four parameters. They really are there in Kelly. And it's even more. When you have three lines in P2, in P3, then you can make, a, for certain combination of lines, you can make a hyperplane. And the hyperplane are in P3, they are called tight tangents, and you have the equations of them as well. So, with this wealth of information is everything that we need. And so I feel like uh, uh, Kelly could have proved our theorem in, in, in some way. So what do we do? How do we get this in our context? The first thing is that we need to consider the pairs where you have cubic surfaces, a smooth cubic surfaces, I apologize for that. But, and you have the 27 lines, but they're going to have a weight on it. The weight is going to be one nine plus epsilon. And this is a difference with the KSBA, uh, with the hack and kill perspective. In the hack and kill uh, world, hack and kill and table left, they use weight equal to one. And we use, uh, let me highlight it. Uh, we use one nine plus epsilon. But why is that one? Because we still need this, a divisor to be ample. And this is the smallest um, weight that led you to happen that. So that's the reason we selected. So this is still ample. And the fact that it's still ample implies that you still have this uh, KSBA theory and that you still have a compact modular space of for these weighted pairs. And then, and then, and then our theorem this is with, uh, I think that the K go before the S, let me correct that. And from myself, uh, Matt and Luca is the Naruki compactification is isomorphic up to normalization, normalization to this module of pairs. So basically the uh, expectation of hacking, kill and develop is correct. This, this 
clock canonical model of the model space is itself a modular space, what you have to do, you have to change. Again, I'm going to highlight it, the weights that you put to the lines. So, I mean, uh, that, I was super happy when we realized that that can be done because it means that over this Naruki space, every point we have an object, we have a geometric object and we know where the 27 lines go. That's kind of what you asked me next. Okay, Patricia, you told me that you want to know what happened with the 27 lines because you see we have our surface and I will have 27 lines and, and then we have the open, right? The smooth surface and 27 lines. But what are you adding to infinity? That, that's the answer, that's kind of part of the statement. And the first thing that you have to add is cubic surfaces with an A1 singularity. They have to go there. But the interesting part about the lines is that the lines start to collide with each other. So for example, when you have only one A1 singularity, you find six double lines. And 15 of the other lines are away from the singularity and you, they don't intersect. But six of the lines, uh, but you have find uh, six double lines. And then I just want to do this little math here that six double lines plus 15 other ones, you still have your 27 one. So that happens when your surface gets this A1 singularity. Now uh, you wonder, well, Patricia, what happens when you get two A1 singularities, three A1 singularities, four A1 singularities? So that's pres I, let me tell you, I mean, we do have answers for all those questions, but let me say about the four A1 singularities, what happened is that the 27 lines collide with each other even further, and now you have six quadruple lines and three away from, and then again, if you add them up, you have 27. So you know where the 27 lines go, but this is, no, you need more. And, and I want you to notice this. When we look at this equation, I want you to notice that this term here, I'm going to highlight it with. And it doesn't have any coefficient. Like every single thing in this family has depends on coefficients, but this doesn't. This, this uh, x plus y, it doesn't do. And then that's kind of, that was kind of the moment in which we, we noticed that what is happening is that you need to consider the surface and the 27 lines. If you look at the 27 lines, you, the 27 lines actually what, have, what they do is they go to nine lines in every plane. So you have these three, this equation means three planes in hyperplane in, in P3. And each plane we have nine lines. And, and I only draw the ones in this side because otherwise, I don't but I, we, we describe it very explicitly in the paper. So you have, there you have, this is the object, the generation of the surface and the, the generation of the 27 lines. And there is a, an observation to do here. They intersect, you have three points that intersect plus infinity. So this means that every axis, you will have a cross ratio. And in every, and here you have another cross ratio and in another here you have another cross ratio. So what I'm trying to say is that you have a device or in this Naruki parameterizing these pairs and their degenerations, of course, as well. Um, so yes, so in, this is the answer. That's our main first theorem with, with Matt and, and Luca. And is we have the modular space for these pairs with these weights that I'm going to remark here. Apologize for that. And we have also a complete descriptions of all the pairs that appear in our modular space. We know all the objects that we are parameterizing. Um, I wanted to, at this point, most of you, oh, a lot of people are familiar with this uh, uh, Montfort um, GIT, and I want to make a comment about it. We are, in this moment, we are using, we are using modular spaces that label the 27 lines, either the hack and kill table lab, which in you, and then the, or the um, one that we just um, described with, that we built with um, Matt and, and Luca. 
And uh, this is the key on it of M0 and bar, if you're familiar with that space. You label the lines and you keep track of that. However, there is this classical compactification from Montfort from 1983, and he doesn't label the lines. I mean, it's the GIT of cubic surfaces, and, and you only see the cubic surface and you only care about them. So, so you wonder how, what's up with them. I mean, what is the relationship between these two point of view? And that's actually important for, for our proof. The first thing that I want to say is that, again, in the literature, you say that the cubic surfaces are marked if you keep in track of the 27 lines, basically. And then, and then you have the one without keeping track of them, just the cubic surfaces, only, only there. Uh, I, think and, I, have a, I think I have yes. a question on the definition yes. I haven't understood. Uh, in any of these spaces where you label the lines, do you have the same cubic surface appearing one, appearing twice with appearing a more, more than twice? Because the lines, yeah. the lines are uniquely yes. defined. You don't, I mean, yes, yes, a, exactly. a, a cubic surface, there's up to 27 lines and the number of lines that there are is not something that uh, can vary. Like it's unique yeah. choice. Which exactly, I think exactly. It's a bit, it's a bit mis, well, I find it a bit misleading I mean, to, to make a comparison to N, M0 and bar because in that case, you know, you have the P1, there's only one, but it appears several times as the points move, whereas the lines can't really move. You can change the labeling, but so, so you're, mean, saying, you're saying that uh, you have several ways of labeling, labeling the same set of yes. lines, and you consider different. Yeah. Right, right, and then, and then, and then what they what if you forget about that completely, then you will have what's precisely what I was going now. If you forget about this label and you have this group, I mean, this is like a like magnificent uh, theory. If you have this group called W is six, and you forget about it, then 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 you get your regular cubic surfaces. But you, but you, I guess <laughs> I guess the question is: so if you have an automorphism of the surface that sends one. A labeling of lines to another labeling of lines, then you only have it once, or you still have it twice. I, I mean, the the surface, the surface. If you don't, if the surface can appear more than once, and this is precisely. And you, what you're asking here is, if you have a cubic surface here, yeah, the fiber, the fiber, you have a finite fiber. No, that I right? understand. But if you have, so say there's a cubic surface, yeah, okay, that sends an, an automorphism group of it, that sends. A labeling of lines to another labeling of lines in your uh, moduli spaces of marked cubic surfaces or smooth cubic surfaces with with labeling. Do these two appear just as one point? Um, the I, I, I mean, we, we can talk about it mo okay, more after the it. talk. But what I'm trying, I mean, this not is not automorphism of the cubic surface really. But uh, you will have more than I mean, you have different this is a finite map so you have different uh, cubic surfaces going to the same one and the difference is different labeling that you can do and the code is that uh, you can blow up uh, p2 at these six points and obtain a cubic surface or there are other six points that will give you the same surface but there are more than one way to contract from the cubic surface to p2 yes. but for now just let me say that the important part I wanted to remark is that this is a finite map and there is a group here, which is called W6. I'm a, I'm a magnificent, it's a really nice story after that. But for now, what we really care is that this will induce a field extension. And then the point that was remarked is that if you have an open, this open with our, our mark cubic surfaces and we have our regular smooth ones, and then you have your GIT, then you can fill your diagram way to speak. And, and this is what we call the GIT of Mark cubic surface. So, um, so basically what I was trying to say is that you have a version of the GIT of Montford. You have a, that keeps track of this uh, information about the lines. And again, if these are finite maps, and then and then and then we we I mean the literature we know a good deal about what kind of uh, what kind of the structure of this map has what. So now I can actually finish this geometric perspective, and this is now after our work and the work of a lot of people. This is 
what it looks like. You have your GIT of cubic surfaces, the one that we know and love and you learn in grad school. If you take, if you want to keep track of the line, you still have a marked version of it. Naruki proof that when you blow up 40 points, you obtain his Naruki, his space in 1980, he built it and he showed that there is this blow up. And our theorem shows that this is a modular space, but for a smaller weights, I'm going to highlight. And then hacking kill Tebelev theorem shows that there is as also a smooth space, it's a smooth projective variety as well, which is a blow up of the Naruki one. So this diagram exists and these are uh, blow up morphisms and you have this finite map. And we know, and I can tell you as I did before, all the objects parameterized by this object, by the object that we constructed, that, that, that we described with Luca and Matt. Uh, before I move on, um, there is a, an observation and is that this one, this modular space has 40 isolated singularities that are isomorphic to this cone, P1 cross P1, P1 to the power of three. And these are the 40 points, 40 points that you blow up. So this one is singular. Let me write it with green here. This one is singular. And, but this one happens to be smooth. And precisely the blow up of those are are these block morphisms. And then you're gone. <laughs> At this moment, if you like my page, you're like, hey, I can go home <laughs> happy with this answer. But I want to bring now the host theory perspective. So for that, um, what's happening here? In the host theory perspective is that you have a cubic surface and you cannot use the cohomology of the cubic surfaces to do host theory to recover a cubic surface. So what you do, the trick is that you go to a cubic tree form. This is a trick that has been used uh, and uh, many times when you go to a cover of it. And of course, the, by the way that is built the cubic and the, and the cubic tree form are determine each other. So now, and again, I will, this is a little, a bit of a lie, but in the cohomology of the cubic tree folds, you are finding the following thing. You find a lattice, you have a decomposition in vector spaces, which induce a flag, and that flag can move. So you have moduli, and you have a bilinear form in the cohomology. So in this linear space, you have uh, you have a lattice, you have a decomposition with a flag on it, and then you have a bilinear form. And these three things define something that is called a polarized pure host structure, uh, with some additional condition. And I want you to notice that it's kind of a linear algebra data that we, this is an, a linear algebra data that we are associating to our cubic trifold. We start with a variety, which is given by equations, and we end up with purely uh, basically linear algebra, uh, vector spaces and flux in vector spaces and bilinear forms. And the theorem from Clemens and Griffins is that that information, that host structure, this pure host structure determines uh, the cubic trifold uniquely. So the consequence of all this perspective is that you have cubic surfaces, which is dimension four, like if you start here with your cubic surface, and then you can have, you can build a cubic trifold by this way, which is what's here precisely. And of course, and then the cubic trifold have also some host uh, structures and there is a module of, of associated to them. And then we can, re we can recover the cubic surface, the cubic trifold uniquely. At uh, this point, you will be like, okay, Patricio, this sounds like a bad deal because you have dimension four, dimension 10 and dimension 15. And then, and then you're kind of putting your space in a bigger and a bigger space. Um, so the key insight for this now, the key observation uh, is that these cubic trifles that we built have a C3 action on it. Um, mu 3 C over 3 C action, a finite group action. And it's just by acting with the cubic root of unity in this variable. And that action leads to cohomology. 
So this setting and then and then it was developed by Alcock called Carson and Toledo uh, in 2002. And from so you have a vector space and then and then you have this group, this finite group and then uh, that implies the following. First is that your your lattice actually can be understood as a module over this uh, I forgot the name Gaussian or Eisenstein ring. Uh, integers. Um, I think that Gaussian integers. I apologize. Should know this. I, I wrote this with this, but anyway. So you basically you can write over a a mole over this ring where you take the third root of unity. The first observation. The second observation is that you have two decompositions. You have because you have the action of a finite group, they and is acting on it in this in this vector space. Then you can decompose in eigenspaces. And the eigenspaces, you can calculate, okay, I only have three elements in my groups. What are the eigenspaces? What is the dimension? And they happen to be dimension five, each pieces. And of course, what I told you at the beginning, you have this, uh, this, this host theoretical decomposition. And when the nice things about this, which is very important in their work, is that all these decomposition are compatible with each other. So what this, I mean that if you just take one of the invariant pieces, then it has kind of his own Hodge uh, decomposition. And you compute, you can compute the dimension of the pieces. One is dimension four, the other one is dimension one. And if you look at the other invariant piece, then it also has a Hodge decomposition and you can compute the pieces dimension one. And, and at this point, I want to remark that all these is, uh, linear spaces data, linear algebra data that I obtained from my equation. Finally, uh, a remark that I want to point later is that this, uh, the, uh, the integral cohomology is actually isomorphic to this ring. And this ring has an emission form of this kind. So uh, the way that I will say, or that you will find the literature is that you have this isomorphism. So I just want to, before I move on, to remark that we have all this uh, structure in our vector spaces, and it came from the finite group um, that we have in our particular cubic tree. So let me um, so let me just a second. I'm coming. So why do we want to do this? Because for a smooth cubic trifold, to recover a smooth cubic trifold, you need the whole, whole structure. However, we just learned from the work of Alco and Toledo that if you have a smooth cubic surface, a smooth cubic trifold from a cubic surface, in that particular case, you have a smaller flag. Yes, this four dimensional space inside this five dimensional space. And these flags are parameterized by an open in P4. I will call it B41. This is the notation, it's an open. So all these flags that we are obtaining from all these flags that we are obtaining from our cubic surfaces, uh, they are all parameterized by um, an open. And the first thing I want you to notice is that it's a four dimensional open. And it's just remarkable because our modular space of cubic surfaces happens to be four dimensional as well. So now you, you, this four dimensional uh, open parameterizing these flags can recover the, it is, you have the correct dimension. Uh, this is a, an important remark. This is an open in the standard topology, no, no the Sarinsky one. Anyway, so we are happy and we say, well, I have a module of cubic surfaces, <laughs> but you have to be worried a bit because along the way, and I didn't tell you because kind of, a little light, but we selected a linear isometry. And this, then because of that, then we have this theorem from Alco and Toledo 2002, in which is the module of cubic, smooth cubic surfaces together with this framing, this isometry that I just here, uh, is isomorphic to our open. So in conclusion, 
these flags, they recover the cubic surfaces with something else, this framing. And that's kind of what, I mean, uh, we can call an eigenspace. Uh, oh, thank you for the for Einstein integers. Thank you. Thank you a lot for the, the, the comment. So uh, the, this is what we call a period map that you can recover the, the geometric data from these flags. At this point, uh, you are like, Patricio, I did no order cubic surfaces with a framing. My order was, uh, I want to see just cubic surfaces by themselves. So how can you do that? What will you do is you will think about the group that exchange framing to each other, right? Because that's kind of the, the framings are your additional information. So you want to see how you, you can move from one framing to each other basically. And, and the group I'm going to call it gamma. And I wrote it here only to make a remark on this. And it's that basically the entries are these Eisenstein integers. So it's a very concrete group first, it's discrete. It's an arithmetic discrete group, very concrete. And um, the entries are basically these, these Eisenstein integers. So it's, 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 it's a bit different to the groups that you use in geometric invariant theory. But this is a group that lets you move from one frame into another. Therefore, if you just take caution by it, we have our theorem. Well, the theorem of Alco and Toledo, which is the following. There are period maps such that um, I will let you read it. You have the smooth frame cubics, and then you map to your, your uh, flags. But you say, no, I want to have a uh, smooth cubic surfaces, no frame, no, without framing. And in that case, you just take a quotient by gamma. Uh, and then this is, uh, this let us interpret our, and I really like, again, I really like this theorem because in one side we have cubic surfaces, which are equations. And in the other side, we have this uh, kind of, linear data in the cohomology that you build. But now we are in the, in the, in the business of compactifying a modular space, right? So what do we do? Hosh theory gave you two compactifications. So, and I, so this open, which is our flags for uh, our, this, which is from uh, the smooth, that you start with a cubic surface and you end up with a point in this open is contained in P4, but it's a standard topology. And when you take the question by gamma of this, and this is a slightly larger open, it's also, you take this question, it's also open. Uh, however, uh, Hosh theory compactifies this in two ways. The bailey borel compactification, uh, the key property for Bailey Borel in our case is that you only add a finite number of points in which the people call, oh, the literature we call it cusp. This finite number of points, uh, so you can tell immediately that this is kind of a small compactification. I wrote here like an intuition about it and I, and I just wanted to, to kind of what do, what do we have here? And is that, remember we have an open and it's an open in the standard topology. And because just thinking norm in the standard topology, we have this uh, boundary on it. The Bailey Borel is built with rational points in that boundary. And they have and and I and the way that uh, this rational makes sense because remember that this group that I wrote here, this group that you need to consider is a uh, discrete and arithmetic. This is a discrete group. So you have to select your elements in the boundary proper, um, correctly, and then you, this is uh, a way to see it, uh, set theoretically at least. However, there is a second compactification given uh, by AMRT, which is uh, in uh, the bulk quotient, 
I, there are only two properties that really matter to us. The first one is that I told you that this has cusp here. You have the cusp. Oh, here I, I already have them. And what you do is you blow them up and you find a device. So the toroidal compactification is itself a bigger compactification. And you have that is uniquely determined for ball fusions. This is not true in general, but it's true for, for uh, cubic singularity. Anyway, so we have these two compactifications. So now let me move to the, the question and is you have these two machineries completely different and you want them to, and you want to know how are these related to each other. So the first thing to put in context here is the theorem of um, Alcock, Toledo, and Carson in 2002, in which they show that there are isomorphism from the GIT to the Bailey Borel. With this gamma I described before, this, this, so this means that, uh, and if you have worked with GIT, there is an open, which is called the staple. And that was precisely this B gamma that I didn't tell you early on. And the smooth cubic surfaces, in here you have a smooth cubic surfaces. This is, they go to this open that we have our, and the elements here, remember, is our H21, our flux, equivalence classes of this flux. So the second theorem of them is that you can find a, a subgroup such that the isomorphism also hold for the mark case. So you have a marking and, 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 and I want you to remark, some, there is something remarkable about this kind of theorem. In here, the marking, the finite data somehow is the finite data that you're adding is uh, um, labeling of the lines. And then you can imagine that there is a lot of labeling that you can add. So, but in this other side of the, of the theorem is you selected a subgroup. And this is a, a part of the theory that is, you can see when you're in the host side and is that you can pick, I, we use this gamma sub M, but you can pick other subgroups and different groups will give you different variable compactifications and they will all be related by finite maps. And, and it happens that you select correctly, then you can just recover the 27 lines. Um, finally, I mean, Alcoa in Toledo, they prove a lot of things, but in particular, they have the following expectation is written within their article. And is that they expect that the Naruki is isomorphic to the toroidal compactification. Uh, and that was uh, an expectation that they have and our theorem with uh, Matt and, and Luca is that the expectation is correct. There is an isomorphism between this Naruki compactification and the toroidal one. So let me just, uh, in the last five minutes, let me get to the uh, conclusion of this, of this. So what is happening is that at this point, you have following, you have a compactification of pairs with the 27 lines. And then if you take the low canonical model of this guy who is smooth, you find the Naruki compactification. And this is, this is space was built by Naruki and the theorem is called, is given to, sorry, is due to Hacking Kid and Tevele. And our first result was that this Naruki compactification is itself a modular space as well. And that, that modular space is what you have to do is you have to change the weights. The weights for the line have to be smaller. 
And if you allow to do that, you will have a smaller, uh, a smaller modular space, and that's precisely what we show. Now, Naruki uh, proved that his space is a blob of the GIT. And also he proved that, uh, and matter of the GIT. And then Alco again Toledo proved that this GIT is actually a belly borel. And uh, our result with Bud and, and Luca is that the Naruki compactification is actually equal to the toroidal. So if you have all this together, you find this diagram that I kind of put here and it's sort of useful for me at least. And is that you have the MMP compactifications going, you reduce the weights and you go low and you can even go all the way to GIT. And if this is a standard of MC bar behavior, if you have seen it or, or modular spaces that you reduce the weights and you can go all the way to, to the GIT. And in this, in this case, just happens to be morphism. In fact, they happen to be blow ups. And then this isomorphism was given by Alco and Toledo and our result is that we can extend that precisely to the toroid. And then, and then I think that we, we thanks to, to the work of all these people and our collaboration with Matt and, and, and Luca, kind of, this is kind of the picture of all those compactifications are related to each other. So just because I have a couple of minutes, um, let me say that to prove this theorem, we actually uh, prove this, to prove this theorem here, we ha actually have a more, a slightly more general uh, uh, setting, which is uh, our right next. This is the lemma that actually has to be done and is an extension result that works for ball quotients. You have a ball quotient of, dim of dimension Rgn2 and you have an, a smooth normal compactification. Then on the relatively mild conditions, you can extend. And just to put in context, um, Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that basically you have a normal crossing compactification with very mild conditions, then it will extend to the toroidal of a ball gush. And this is um, this is kind of um, expected from this sort of behavior, normal crossing compactification. So the word to, to prove, you asked me, Patricio, I have another modular space, which is a ball quotient. I want to prove this kind of result. In my opinion, the, the kind of the hard work somehow is to build this a smooth normal crossing compactification, which is usually the geometric side. And you also need to have an understanding of where the group acts, if it acts freely or not. In, in your in your in your space. Anyway, uh, that was uh, I finished uh, two minutes early that I meant to, but uh, uh, thank you. That was kind of. I'm happy to answer questions now, or to or to, I can give more details if someone wants to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, we have questions, time for questions. Okay, I have a question. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so as you well know, we have a, a moduli of compact moduli of pairs where it considers the pair to be an anti-canonical divisor. And in a way, what you are doing is you're considering pairs that take nine times this anti-canonical divisor, and then you're choosing a very specific uh, element in the equivalent model of pairs. And uh, I wonder if there's any relation between the two. I know the dimensions change, though. So. Right. So, so um, I mean, 
there is this uh, module of, of rational surface with anti canonical device source uh, theory. Uh, I am for like of uh, rational surfaces with anti canonical device source. And then, and then it's kind of in this sense by what you, and exactly how you say it is that, um, so what you're talking about, you have a, a surface, a cubic surface, and you have a device or, ooh, it's kind of big, right? And you have a device or D which belongs to kind of too much. This is in the linear system of the anti-canonical. And the problem is this has dimension seven. You could, you could make it. You could make it live in minus three times anti canonical. Uh, I know that. Yeah, this is actually the, the, nine, nine, the nine times maybe anti canonical. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. So so that's the beauty and the and the curve. Somehow you have more than what you can pick your divisor. There is nothing that stop you from picking a, a divisor. You can and then you have kind of the in the theory will work most of the time. I mean, there are there are technical issues that have to be pay attention with the coefficients that you select and things like that. But in general, yes. Okay, Patricio, I think no one has heard you for the last 30 seconds. Uh, I thought it was my fault. Uh, so I didn't want to say anything, but. Alexander Duncan cannot hear you either. No sound. Maybe he doesn't hear us either. Okay, this has never happened before. I know what to do. Shall I call him? Hey, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah, no, 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 so my husband just decided to say this is enough. I've been, <laughs> it's too long, 15 minutes. I only, I only sign up for 15 minutes, <laughs> no more. So I uh, apologize for that. I, I lost the iPad. No, no probably seen anything. But uh, so tell me, uh, uh, so sorry, yes. So uh, yes, you have choices. This is the, the beauty and the curse somehow, and is that you have all those choices about which device or you put. You can put the can anti canonical, or you can put. But you, but, you, but you can't really because uh, this uh, you want the twenty seven lines to figure into your in your divisor. You need at least to go up to nine. I think it's nine times minus k. Yeah, three times nine, nine times minus k. Yeah. So you at least you need to consider minus nine k. And then I think yeah, you, you can put weights, right? You can also put weights to to balance them out to be so the total sum is. is but the, is, the, the lines are the lines. I mean. No, but you can put weights. These are divisors. They are few divisors. You can put line weights on them, and then. And okay, go. but then you don't have a linear system. You wrote a linear system between bars. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So in that sense, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it is possible. It is, and it, it just have to be set up with care. It, it, that's kind of part of the other problem. Okay. Okay, there was another question that I should have asked before I asked mine, but I didn't notice the chat from Armand uh, Bru I forgot the surname. Armand Brumer, who says, What is a discrete group, the discrete subgroup, gamma sub m? Thank you. I apologize that I lost the. So it is, uh, it is, um... right. So it's, uh, I think that it's. Con it's um... 
So you have to use the ideal and I think that is one minus I. I, I am I'm happy to, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, if you send me, I apologize. Yeah, so you. this group basically is the unitaria group for one, but with the isosten integers and you have to use an ideal to define this as it's uh, gamma M and I think that the ideal is one minus I. Uh, one um, minus rho, I think is rho. One minus like, rho. One minus? Uh, one minus rho, the ideal above three. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I yes. Think that's what it must be. That occurs very frequently. No, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, um, thank you a lot. It is, it is completely determined by, by Alco and Toledo and then, uh, yes. But I mean, of course, uh, uh, something that I really would like to understand and if the audience there, I mean, they're experts, I will, is that how, what is the geometric interpretation for other choices of gamma? Because for this particular gamma sub M, you, you interpret it like the label of the, of the 27 lines, but you can have other choices. You can go to a neat subgroup, other kind of subgroups, and then we don't have geometric interpretations for them. Thank you. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Well, let's thank Patricia again. Thank you.